does the thing. I'm as dumb as a moose when it comes to the computers. So I said to Dash, I said, Dasha, tell, I can't, this isn't working. She says, give it to me. So she, she was there. And then she, uh, uh, I heard suddenly, ah! I said, what? She wouldn't tell me. I said, what? She says, you were half Irish. <laughs> Instantly, Sean Murphy came to my mind for some reason. I don't know what, I, oh my Lord. Now I knew my great, great grandmother was Grandma Kelly. I knew that. But to the extent that these Irish people have weaseled their way into my bloodline, it's terrifying and wicked. And uh, so, I think I was like eleven percent Scandinavian with her, and the, she didn't. She never saw anything else. She just saw the fifty percent Irish, and the rest doesn't matter. And um, well, any top of the morning to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus help me. And uh, but I looked. I looked at the. I looked at the. There's a map that shows you where your ancestor come from, and um, a little bit did come from the Northern Irish part, but it, the, the the red is bit was the southwest of Scotland. So the, the Scots and the Irish, the reason why we look similar is for reddish hair and we all are, the Scots and the Irish were mixed up. The English took us from Scotland, true, this is a true story. The English took the Scots from Scotland to Ireland for the potato um, harvests. And that's how the mix up became. So it's the English, any English folk here today? Well, we're going to shoot you all after church. We're just letting you know that now. Because the reason why I've got half of my DNA being uh, Irish is because those English people. It's Blame the English, I'm telling you. It's all the English. Well, I am thrilled to be home. I tell you what, this is an amazing feeling. I'm going to tell you that God is doing amazing things in our ministry. Restoration that you will not believe you're going to hear it some of today. And um, what the devil meant for evil, guess what God does? He turns it around for good. And if you're here today and you've been attacked by the enemy, I've got great news for you. God has not yet finished speaking. And when he speaks, the heavens open. Talking about heavens open, I came up here on Friday. Ali, come up here a second, will you? I've got my oldest granddaughter with me, and she's never been to Washington, D.C., so I took my girl to see the White House. Donald never let me in, but never mind. We stood outside. This is my oldest granddaughter. Her name is Allie Cameron. Now, how old are you? Eight. And uh, what school do you go to? Cornerstone. Cornerstone. And what's your favorite subject? Math. That ain't Irish, I'll tell you now, anyway. <laughs> and where, where, where have you been with Granddad this last couple of days? Um, you saw the White House? Yes. In the George Washington Monument? Yes. Was it raining? Yes. How bad? Not that bad. <laughs> we nearly drowned in Arlington. It was so bad, I was looking for a place to lie down. I thought, well, I'll just, there, there was 27 um, funerals that day, and I'm thinking, well, what's one more? I'm going to drown right here. And just, you know, I tried to sneak up as close to Kennedy as I could, and then there's, I couldn't find any open spaces. But uh, this is my oldest granddaughter, and I asked her this morning, I said, are you a homey person, or are you a roadie person? In other words, you're going to stay home with Grandma and her, her mom and dad, or are you going to come on the road with your granddad? And what did you say? I'm a road person. She's a road person. So you go and make sure you say hi to Allie after church. And she is the primest, most proper one. Her younger sister, Kara, is a bulldozer. I mean to tell you, she is something else. And how many, how many recognize my grandson, Roy, Rowan, my minion? How many ever see my minion? If you're not on my Facebook page, you are missing the most fun you've ever seen in your life. The only problem is I've got a thousand people waiting to get on, and I'm up to my limit, so I don't know what to do. So anyway, 
It is a joy to be here, and God is doing amazing things with us. Um, you, you remember a couple of years ago, the devil came against us in a ter terrible way. And uh, instead of it, it killing us, it's made us stronger. And, and we are seeing things happen. You are not going to believe. You are not going to believe what God is going to allow us to share with you, what, what's happening. You're going to be excited. But I have a word, I believe, for your spirit today. Because the devil wants to come and destroy your faith. And the, but, but let me tell you, so almost as bad as faith is destroying your hope. Hope is a tender root that can soon be destroyed by a circumstance. I look at kids all the time. Some of the girls you'll meet in a few minutes. The thing that we gave them wasn't faith. They were, they were too broken to have faith. I could have preached faith to them all, all day, all night, and it would never have registered inside their heart. But what we did was we gave them hope. And once your hope be, is established, then your faith can be rooted and grow. And so I want to tell you something. If you're in a circumstance today, the devil is, is after two things in your life. One is faith. Faith is what moves mountains. Faith is what creates. Hope is the platform that faith stands on. So if you're, if you're loving someone that's in a bad situation, if you're caring and reaching out to people that are going through a tough time, don't preach faith to them. Because sometimes faith sounds like you're condemning them. What's wrong with you? Why can't you believe? Most times when you're in the crisis of your life, you can't believe for anything except the breath that you're breathing right now and you hope there's another one coming. I'm going to understand what I'm saying. But the wonderful thing about hope is hope leads to faith. So the devil will attack you in two areas. Hope. What's that saying? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And what the devil will try to do is to take away your hope. And I'm here to tell you that God is is in the hope business. You are not done yet. The best is yet to be. Turn to someone and say, I'm not done yet. Go and tell them. I'm, it's not over yet. Tell them again. I'm not, it's not over yet. God's on my side. And I have hope. Say it. I have hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust or have faith in the sweetest frame, but holy lean. On Christ the solid rock I stand. You see, he's our hope. He's our hope. He's the foundation that you have first. And once you develop hope, then you start believing for things outside of yourself. And the reason why most people never get to faith is because the devil attacks them at their hope level all the time. So I'm hoping a blessing in your life. I'm releasing blessing in your life. And in chapter 6 of Judges, it says that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, the strongholds, which are in the mountains. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, now listen, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up also, Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them. And they would encamp against them and destroy the produce as, of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep. What is sheep? Sheep is where you get your clothing from. Sheep is where you eat your meat. So they destroy if the devil can get you panicked over what, where you're eating and what you're wearing, you can't even move from what your point is. He's got your hope destroyed right there. So the, the enemy came up, come up at the point of harvest. You see, if he attacked the seed, they might get more seed and have time to put it back in the ground. But once the seed's in the ground and you destroy it, you haven't only destroy, destroyed the material, which is the seed, you've destroyed the time that you'll never get back to, re to, to replant the seed. Take my seed from me and I might get more seed. 
put my seed in the ground, then destroy it, and I've lost a season of harvest. How many seasons of harvest have you lost in your life? How many times have you put things in the ground and you've seen them begin to grow and suddenly the Midianites and the Amalekites show up and they destroy it. And the Bible says there was nothing left. Listen now, neither sheep nor ox. Ox is your John Deere tractor. That's what you plow the ground with. That's where your future lies. That's where your future harvest lies. So he killed the sheep, their, their food and their clothing. He killed their means of making money to continue on their life. Then the next thing he said, nor donkey. A donkey in those days is what got you from point A to point B. If I could take the donkey from you, you are stuck. There was a man that fell amongst thieves. You know the, you know the story in the Jericho. And what did he do? He poured in oil and wine. And then what did he do? He put him on his donkey. He carried him away from the crisis he was in to healing and health. And what the devil will do to you in your life is he will take you away from, from, from material things, the clothes that you need to wear and the food you need. And then he'll attack your workplace and then he'll isolate you in that place so you can't get to from where you are to where God ordains you to be. That's the work of the enemy. He will isolate you, starve you, Take away the ability to work. But I can use for you. God always has an angel that shows up. And I may be half Irish, but I believe God sent me like an angel that he tell you something. Half of me is not Irish. And that is something to hold on to. By faith. The other half may be strong enough to negate that half. Listen to what happened. So Midianites would come up and, and the Amalekites, sorry, verse 5, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming up as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number and they would enter the land to destroy it. Now isn't it interesting that they come up with their lives, livestock to, to destroy. Do you know what the livestock were doing? The livestock were eating what the Israelites had prepared. They took their stuff to eat your stuff. Hmm. Okay? So greatly, Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who impressed you and drove, you out, drove them up before you and gave you their land. And also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, for you have not obeyed my voice. The cost of disobedience and not believing God's promise is you're going to lose your sheep, you're going to lose your ox, and you're going to lose your donkey. There was a reason why these things were done. Listen to what happened. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while the son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress. Understand, it is not the wine season, it's the wheat season. So Gideon has taken what little wheat he's managed to gain, and instead of going to the wheat threshing floor like he would do he went to the wine press and in the wine press where no one be expected to go and find him that's where he began to work on his wheat it was not an act of bravery it was an act of incredible cowardice that he was thinking I'm going to hide wherever I can so while in the act of threshing wheat in the wine press the angel appeared and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And why are all his miracles which our fathers told about, saying, Didn't the Lord bring you out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us in the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the might of yours, and you'll save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So Gideon said, Oh, Lord, how can I save Israel? Now listen to this. My clan, my tribe... 
is the weakest in Manasseh. Manasseh is one of the weakest tribes. So his family is the weakest in all of the tribe of Manasseh. Well, it's the weakest in all of the tribes of Israel. And I am the weakest in my father's house. Have you got that? Israel, Manasseh, father's house, the poorest, and he's the lowest in his father's house. So you are talking here to the worst, least qualified, weakest guy in the whole land of Israel. Except one wee thing, God chose him. And I can use for you, if God be for you, who can be against you? He can find you in a corn patch. He can find you out looking after sheep when the prophet has come to anoint the next king. And when Eliab doesn't get the crown, the prophet says, are all the sons here? And they say, there's one that's here. But he's not here, but he's not worthy to even be considered for the position. His name is David. He's a stupid boy. He writes these ridiculous songs on a harp. And we send him out in the cattle. And he looks after the sheep. That's all he's good for. And he sits on rocks all day. And he's got this dumb harp. And he writes these songs. And he writes songs like the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. The whole heavens declare his handiwork. This boy is a lunatic. And the prophet says, I'm not going to sit down till you bring him. And when everyone else had disqualified David from being the king, I got news for you. The anointing of God chose the one that no one else would have chosen. And he, God had to tell the prophet, don't you look at this boy on the outside. I know he's got a red face. You know why he had a red face? Because they chased him from the mountains in to see the prophet. He was sweating up a storm. And he says, I see the inside of this boy. And when the oil, the, the horn was opened up, the oil flowed. And the king of King David was anointed king. So I got news for you. I don't care where you are. I don't care what mess you're in right now. I don't care what kind of uh, backwood side street that you've been stuck in for ages. God knows where you are. He knows your address and there's a season. Everybody has a season. There are times when we're high. There are times when we're low. But I'm telling you now, I'm not stuck where I am. I'm on my way to something better in the name of Jesus. I am not here. I am not here permanently. Whatever it is, I'm, not, I'm only on the way through. I'm a pilgrim passing through. You are not where you are forever. I don't care how dark your day is today. God is on your side. And if God be for you, no one else can stand against you. Now that's hope. Did you hear me? That's hope. How many, get in, how many feeling some hope inside you right now? I'm feeling some hope right now. I'm feeling some hope right now. And listen to this. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I'll be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If I found favor in your sight, then show me a sign. It is you with, who talk to me. Do not depart from here. I pray you until I come to you and bring you my offering. Here is the qualification of Gideon. The Bible says there was no sheep, no oxen, no cattle. They say the whole place was in famine. They were impoverished. And yet, when the angel showed up, Gideon had something that nobody else had. Gideon had a sacrifice. He had gone to his back door to kill it a hundred times. Hungry, family hungry. And he's put a knife in his hand to go and slit the goat's throat. Something happened inside, and he says, one more day. I'll, I'll leave you one more day. And when the Lord's eyes go to and fro the earth, he found a man who had an offering. And an angel sat down and waited for an offering to be prepared. You know the story, don't you? 32,000 men rallied to his cry. God says, there's too many of them. All the ones that are scared, go home. So Gideon said, if you're scared, go home. I'd have been on the first bus. I'm, I'll tell you now. I've been thinking, this is insane. If, if their camels are without number and they're without number, 32,000 people is not a lot of people. 
22,000 up and left. And he's now got 10,000. I'm thinking, I'll be thinking, okay, uh, that's, I'm not asking no more. God says, there's too many. Make him drink. And those that put their head in the water, send them home because they've got no vision. If your head's stuck in the water, you can't look around you, you're sunk. Because see, when your head goes down, guess what comes up? God's on our side, but God help us get the butts out of church in Jesus' name. Are you with me? Should, should I, is that a bad word? Is that okay? 300 men. 300 men. Lit a flame. Hit it in a pot. Smashed a pot. The sword of the Lord and Gideon be upon you. And they utterly destroyed the enemy. I'm going to ask you this morning, how many here want to be one of Gideon's 300 men? Let me see your hand. I, I, my hand is up. I want to be one of the Gideon's men that will look at the enemy and say, I'm going to come and I'm going to cut you in little pieces in the name of Jesus. You've got my family impoverished. You've got my life in doubt. I've lost my hope. In the name of Jesus, God is going to anoint me to come after the devil that's been coming after me. And I'm going to turn tables on him. And I'm going to chop him and slice him and dice him until he never wants to come and mess with me again in the name of Jesus. Is that you? Lift your hand up. I want to pray for you right now. Father, every hand that's raised, you know the hearts in this place. You know the Gideons that are in this place. You know the sheep and the oxen and the horse that has been destroyed. In the name of Jesus, I release upon this place a, a faith and a hope of Gideon that we will look at the impossible and say, if God be for us, there's no battle anymore because he is going to give us the victory in the name of Jesus. Say, I decree hope in my home, faith in my heart that God is on my side. Devil, I'm coming to get you. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, let me tell you something. That's more than just a nice word. That's a word from the Lord to you. Because that's a word to my spirit. And um, I went through a couple of years ago having no hope. And um, we are happy to tell you that we are not just, we don't have hope anymore. We've got faith. And uh, we are seeing some ridiculous things all through the summer months right now. Our kids are busy in camps. And um, these kids, what's happened is the orphans that we found 10 years ago, 8 years ago, have now matured into adults. They're now 25, 26 years of age. And instead of me having to go there all the time and go to the orphanage and try to explain to kids that we would house them for them to be safe in, our kids can go instead. They speak Romanian. I don't speak Romanian. And, and they were orphans, and they, they know the rooms where these kids stay in. They know the abuse these kids have taken. So what's happened is the kids that I save are now the ones that are out there saving and doing a better job than I did. Isn't that crazy? And uh, so we are having some amazing times. Let me say this. We are seeing some tremendous breakthroughs with churches coming to Moldova. How many, would like, how many think that this church, after all that you've stood with us, how many think that some of y'all need to come and see some of us in Moldova? Let me see your hand. How many believe that's a God idea right there? Well, don't put your hand up and not go and apply for your passport tomorrow morning. How many would be, in, seriously, how many would be interested in going for a week-long tour and actually work beside our kids in, in feeding the homeless and, and uh, going out to the poorest places? I mean, you've never seen any. Anywhere in the world, listen to me, any poorer than this European country. You go out into the countryside, and there's no wells. I mean, there's no running water. There's no toilets. It's a horrendous place. And the widows are dying because the kids have left for Italy, and they, they forget their, their own kids. And, and the, so the grandmother's trying to look after the grandkids, and she's got no money, and she's sick because there's no health care there. And um, we, we have, in fact, a church just came back last week. And they wrote me and says, we, have, we are forever changed. And so I, I don't know who the person is in the church that would coordinate all these things. Who's the pastor? Is it you or your better half? See, uh, yeah. Uh, you or, 
I know, I know, I know the one I've talked to. Nothing, you know, nothing against you, Sean, but you know, I, I, I know who I would be talking to. Anyway, so what I'm saying is, but I love either the end of this year or next year for some of you to come and see what we have done and what you have done through us. And uh, we are just watching great things. I got four kids with us here this morning. Come up here, well, then, kid, these are some of the older ones, and. Uh, Thank you, darling. Thank you, thank you. These, uh, what's happening is now some of our younger kids are at university, and uh, so our older kids are now having to come over on shifts because they're working in the ministry, and then they come over and spend a little while. Um, Sylvia's with us just now and Tanya until September. How long? You guys been about, about a month now, is that right? About a month. And so two months for you and one month for me. And they're going home in September, which I hate. I love them coming. I hate them going home. But we, we ha for those that don't know to catch you up, we have six homes in Moldova right now, and we have one in the Ukraine. And we are seeing crazy things happen in the Ukraine. It's just wonderful what God is doing. And, and uh, in fact, this week, a bunch of our kids, we're, we're having camp in the Ukraine right now with the kids that are in the Ukraine. So this week, our kids from uh, Moldova are taking a four-hour bus ride up to the Ukraine. And um, in the Ukraine, they speak Russian. And in Moldova, they speak Romania, but they also speak Russian. So our kids will be, will be preaching the gospel um, in a different country. Isn't that amazing? So uh, God has done this, and your support. Let me say this. Those of you in this church that support us monthly, those folks who give a dollar a day and ten dollars a month, some do a hundred. Let me tell you something. You are the life's blood of this ministry. We could not do what we do to pay the bills every month. To take, I mean, these kids, when they come into us, they come with what they're standing up in. We literally have a, a, a welcome box with clothes for them. And a pair of jeans is $60 in Moldova. In fact, we were at the mall yesterday. How much did you buy those jeans for? I think $10. $10. She came out. I, I, don't, I don't believe in going to shops. I, I, I view going into a shop the same way that I would view going into a bar. Equal, both would destroy my soul equally. You understand what I'm saying? So if you ever see us in the mall, you'll see me sitting on a seat outside the mall. And if needs must, if needs must, I mean a desperate need arises, I might go to the edge of the store and have them come and say, is this okay? And I'll go, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll be back in the seat. I'll be back. I'll, I'll, you know what I am. So they came out yesterday. What store did you all go to? H&M. H&M. And they found great jeans for $10 and tops that are $5. And uh, so uh, then Andrew found in, was it Oakley yesterday, Andrew? We found shirts, beautiful Oakley brand shirts for less than $10 each. So we've got young men that work in our ministry. And uh, we, how many, we, we bought like $700,000 uh, of stuff for $200. We, we got $1,000 of stuff yesterday for $200. You, now, my Scottish heart, <laughs> that's what I knew. I don't get what he says. I'm more Scottish than Irish right there. Because my Scottish heart was, oh, I was dancing in the, I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. There's a God in heaven, and he's in this mall right now, I'm telling you now. Anyway, but let me say this to you. Anytime you're out shopping, and you see jeans that are 4 or $5, small size jeans for guys, buy them. Buy them. Get them for the orphan's hands. Because all of you all see bargains every day. And you'll, I know how you women are, because I've got a wife for 42 years. And you'll pick up something, you'll say, oh, that's a good, who would that fit? Orphan's hand. You hear me? Orphan size. Size zero, size two, size four. Little, little things. And um, anything else? Boy, they're all, aren't, aren't they all chirpy this morning? Isn't it great? <laughs> but we are seeing God do some crazy are part of this ministry. And uh, I think there's something I want to share with you that I can hardly really tell you. So I'm going to have someone testify, and then I'll come and tell you about it. Come up here, Tanya, will you? Tanya, did you know this pastor was a day? Yes, I knew it. How long have you been with us? Um, about seven years already. Seven years ago, this devastated little girl. Now, uh, there's two guys in the back doing this. What does this mean? 
Did she share the last time she was healed? How many remember she shared the last time she was healed? Three of you, fine. She speaks better English now than she did back then. She came to our, our home and was so broken and so shy that she literally hid from me for a year and a half. So afraid of being rejected. One, a heart still at home. A heart couldn't take any more rejection. And uh, one night I was sitting with all the kids. My wife was there. And she was sitting on the ground across the living room. And I was sitting on a chair. And she got out and she crawled over and sat beside me on, on the floor. And she kind of leaned against me. And it was the first time in a year and a half. And I just watched her. And I never, I never, I never try and break down the walls. I can't break down high walls. She could have broke down her own wall. And I sat and I've been watching her and praying for her. And that night, it was like the 4th of July. It was amazing to watch her. A week got old, find a dad. And um, that is amazing. So tell them how you got into her life. Because most of these folks have never seen or heard you before. Ignore them. I'm 22 years old, and I grew up in a very poor family. My dad never wanted to accept me as his daughter, and the worst was that we live in the same village, and he would even talk to me or turn around and look at me. Um, I have a mom and an older sister. She's married now. Until fourth grade, I, w I studied in the village, and because I was very poor, I didn't have like books or nice clothes like the other kids. And they, I would be rejected by everyone. I wouldn't have friends. And the teachers was very bad to me. Uh, after a while, my mom started to work in an alimentary shop in the village. And you know, like in the villages, people don't really afford to buy food they don't have money. And my mom would give them food like to help them. And they had to return this money to my mom, but they never did. And because of that, she got in debt. It was stayed for $300. And her boss cut her. And because of that, she was put in the prison for six years and a half. And that's how I ended up in the orphanage. I never knew that. I never knew actually about the orphanage before, and my life just fell apart. And the saddest thing was that my mom wasn't beside me anymore, and I was an orphan, and I had no hope. I was rejected by everybody. I, w I didn't know what's love. I didn't know that there is a God for somebody that loves me just the way I am. And then one day I met Cameron's family and through them I met God. And you know, when you live a life full of like people saying that you are not good, you're stupid, you're just like your mom and you'll end up in the prison, your kids will grow up in the orphanage and you start to, to believe in what people say. But when you meet God, you, you understand that you are just what he says. You are his daughter, and you are love. And <laughs> thank you very much for your help, and thank you that through you, God helps us to help our kids and to give them a hope and a house. Thank you. Isn't that great? Not what blows my mind is I'm watching her just now and never heard English. Never heard English. Never heard a kind word. That night when she came over beside me on the ground, I reached out and I, I just patted her back. The first kindness she'd ever had in her life. I gave her her first hug. Never had a kind word. Never I love you. Never you're beautiful. Never you're smart. All the time, you're nothing. 
your mother doesn't know about you. Your mother's in prison. Your father doesn't know about you. They beat them. They beat them psychologically. They punish them every day they live. On all their paperwork, orphan. So when they try and get a job, they give their paperwork across the desk. And the guy looks at it and sees the words orphan. And in Moldova, an orphan is a thief. And an orphan is a liar. And an orphan will cheat. And they'll, they'll beat you for the start. And God allows us to go and say, you are special. God has a plan. If you are born, God has a plan for your life. And what we do is I, I watch hope be established first. And once there's hope, then you plant the seed of the gospel. And then faith begins to rise. And I now have got the craziest bunch of kids in Moldova that when, when God talks to me, I dare not tell them what God's telling me because if I do, they, they think it's going to happen now. They don't understand the mechanics of going out and finding the money to build something or buy something or do something. I say, we're, we're, we're getting a new van. Okay, so immediately in the lexicon, when the new van comes, we're going to do this and we're going to do this with the new van. And I'm going... Can you wait a wee while? And uh, so every time I've got a vision, honestly, I speak it out to them, and then they are my reminders. They are the people that come back and say, Dad, when, when are we opening this house in the Ukraine that you said you're going to open? When is that going to happen? And uh, we, we have just, just watched faith go up in their minds and spirit. Um, come here, Dasha, a second. Dasha, um, she is pain in the neck really <laughs> she, she lives in America with us um, I met this kid how many remember the story how there was three girls on a park bench and I picked three off remember Natalie Andrew's wife isn't here this weekend she's in the west coast I just went back to the west coast yesterday and then Dasha was there and her cousin Nadia now Nadia is the head girl in Moldova so Natalie married my son Nadia is the head girl in Moldova. And this wee thing here, who had gone through tremendous sorrow in her life along with her cousin, I said to her one day, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an education in America. If, you're, if you can keep at school. Because when I met her, 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 her spirit and her faith, she had none. The saddest, saddest thing I've ever seen in my life. And um, she just graduated. Magna cum laude. In, in, on the dean's list from Auburn University. Is that crazy? Okay, thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, when my mom got pregnant, my dad told her that he wants to have a boy, so I ended up being born out ghetto, as you see. And he left, never came back. My mom became an alcoholic. And in two years, she left me with my uncle and his family and went away to Russia. I only saw her a few days a year, and I was lucky enough. In my uncle's family, um, his wife would start the day with telling me how worthless I was, and I was a mistake that my mom has made, and that I wasn't wanted. After a few years, um, I was sent in the largest orphanage in the country. We were 800 kids. And... Um, We all were just numbers that no one wanted. We had no hope. And every single day, we'd start the day with wanted to die. And we'd go to bed thinking that, you know, we're, we're labeled for the rest of our lives. It's worthless. And um, after a few years, I knew I had to leave the orphanage. Every boy and girl, when they turned 16, we were put out at the orphanage. And I was so afraid of the life outside the orphanage gate. I thought that my life was going to end. I didn't see the point on going on and fighting f for what. And when I was 16, I met the Cameroon family. And just when I thought that my life was about to end, my life just started. And the difference... What has made a difference in my life and our 
our lives is, is a bed. We had a bed in the orphanage, but that bed came as a, a reminder of our parents' mistakes. It was a punishment. And every night we'd go to bed, we wanted to stay asleep forever because there was no hope in waking up. The bed that the Cameron family provided for us, it came with unconditional love, a chance to redemption, and a future and hope. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for Dad, for giving us a chance, for giving me a chance, and for being there for us every single day. And I know that no matter how many times I've told we were a mistake, I know that God never makes mistakes because he's so perfect. <laughs> and I'm so thankful for God's army that has invested in our life through the ministry of Orphan's Hands because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you guys. So thank you. seed coming home, your harvest coming back. Some of you gave to help me. Some of you gave to help me before some of these kids were born. Some of you all invested in my life, in the ministry, when all of this was just a whimsy, light hope. Now you're seeing the fruit of your giving, of your faithfulness, of your prayers. And I'll tell you what, that's something else right there. That, that I just saw when, when Dash was talking just now, I just realized that some of you all made, made Dash's life possible. She tried to kill herself twice because there was no hope. No hope. Her auntie used to call her the B word every day. You're nothing but a reminding her where she came from. And people and army made it possible. There are two ways you can help us. One is by giving monthly. All that we do, the bills we pay, the, the gasoline and diesel is $4, $5 a gallon. Gas is from Russia. How many have heard us talk about the Russian gas, how Europe depends on Russia's gas? Even Trump in, in Europe was saying to the people, we're going to stop the monopoly of Russia holding the gas over. He, he has all of Western Europe in his grip. And by us sharing gas with them, you'll break that hold that he has over them. But in Moldova, they'll switch off the gas, and seven folk, ten folk, fifteen folk will die of, of cold, and the government will pay the bill, double the price, and then they'll switch the gas back on again. And that's the kind of stuff we face every day. And how we've managed to do what we've done is by people giving one dollar a day. A dollar a day will not change your financial future other than bless you. Because when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. But a dollar a day, you can put your quarters out of your pocket and change, and you'll have that amount every month to give to help me feed these kids in Moldova. And we've got a card that just says, change a life for a dollar a day. And if you'd like to get one right now, put your hand up, and they'll come and give you one. Fill it out if you would right now. And um, I know many of you already are supporting. I feel like I'm talking to the converted here, I, 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 you know. But if, if for chance you have never taken this opportunity, please do so. And you can be part, in fact, someone, when I came in today, someone came up and said, man, your letters and the, in, the information you give us every month just is so encouraging as to see what God is doing. And um, so uh, just take one of those, fill it out right now if you would, and um, write as clear as you can because when these, these kids aren't here, they volunteer in the office, and you should hear them trying to say your names in the towns where you come from, the way you write this, it's, it's something else. And if you fill that out and give it back at the table, Dasha wrote a book, 
been titled Out of the Ashes. There are kids that you'll never meet. You can't come here because of just there's too, so many of them. And they don't speak English. So what Dasha did was she got them to tell their story to her, and she translated it into English. And um, you will read some of the most unbearable stories of pain and grace in this book. So if you get, if you've got a card, go back to the table, bring your card, and I'll give you this book. You can buy the book as well for ten dollars, I believe. You get that. I want you to listen. I'm, I'm going to ask Sylvia to come and sing. This lovely girl is Dasha's little cousin. And so there's four in the family. When the three older ones left and we got them, she was left by herself in the orphanage with no hope. And uh, one day I was walking across the courtyard of the orphanage and I literally, now this is true, this is just true, I literally bumped into her. And there was no one else, I mean, it wasn't a crowd. And I says, hey, and I says, who's this girl? Her face was just red out of embarrassment that I bumped into her. And, and I says, what's your name? And she says, Sylvia. And someone says, oh, that's Nadia's little sister. So I grabbed her. I said, you come with me. So I grabbed her hand, went into the director's office, and I said, don't you think sisters should be together? Now, I just put 200, 391 windows in this orphanage for $200,000. And when he couldn't say no, and he says, yes, y yes. I said, well, she's coming home with me right now. And she left with us that day. Isn't that crazy? So sing for us, will you please? God of the hopeless, the life to display. God of aborted, unwanted, and plain. God of the children who never get named. God of unlikely. God of no chance leads beggars to banquets and cripples to dance. God of unlikely shows unlikely me to be a part of his family. God of the orphan, fatherless and despised. God of the desperate, give sight to the blind. God of the lonely, forgotten and sad. God of the broken, make wounded hearts glad. God of unlikely, God of no chance, beats beggars to banquets and cripples to dance. God of unlikely, chose unlikely me to be a part of his family. God of unlikely never gives up on a diamond in the rough. God of unlikely 
It's beggars to banquets and people's to dance. God of unlikely, chose unlikely me to be a part of his family. To be a part of his family. Thank you. Everyone can be a part of his family. Let's take it out as far back as I can. I want you to look at something that is so big. Two years ago, I lost everything. one part that I want you to keep desperately in Moldova and it was denied me and I kept saying to Andrew over and over again if I could just get back there if I could just get back and uh, Vatra is a village of six homes and uh, watch this video God gave me Watch this. Moldova is a nation in a desolate place, torn between the east and the west, stuck between yesterday and tomorrow. It has the highest alcoholism rate in the world and has been voted the unhappiest place on earth. Poverty and alcohol is a deadly mix. It breaks the home. It causes unimaginable suffering. It creates orphans. Children are abandoned as their parents go abroad to find work. Often, they never come back, and children become another statistic in a land of lies. From the orphanage or poverty-stricken village, it is a short step to the arms of the trafficker and a life of unspeakable loss. Standing on street corners anywhere in the world, being sold as much as thirty to sixty times a day. Once a girl is broken, she won't fight back. Lost into a world of shame, pain, stress, and violence. Each girl can earn their captor three hundred thousand dollars a year. Trafficking is more profitable than drugs. Yet, in the midst of all this sorrow. A miracle is taking place. Orphans are finding hope through the work of the orphan hand. They are finding their broken hearts healed by God's love, and hope is turning into action. These amazing kids, once redeemed, have an unstoppable desire to help those who have been left behind. They have become missionaries to those who are. We are growing. We desperately need more space. We have been praying, and God has given an answer. Vatra Village. Six homes that will hold 90 kids. Vatra means health. A place of warmth and comfort. Something most of these kids have never known. These beautiful homes are not yet complete. But by God's grace, they will be the heart and the heart of many kids who today are alone. In these rooms, care and love, hope and healing will transform pain into purpose and loss into love. Standing a few hundred feet from Moldova's largest lake, Vatra was sold for over one million dollars just a few years ago. Today, it has been offered to the orphan's money for the miraculous price of $600,000. The owners know what we do. They want us to help the youth of their nation. Just think, 
was a huge patch of grey and in the hell of traffic it reeked and gone vapor village a place of hope to save countless lives will you help us to save these broken women from cold street corners and offer them a hand a hand thank you Isn't that amazing i the week that I went with Andrew to open up our home in Odessa, a representative for the people that own these houses drove up to a blizzard to meet me. The last organization couldn't make the payments. They repossessed it, offered it back to me, and said, all the money you gave before, we will count that against how much the original price was. with hope. So last July the 4th, just a few weeks ago, Nadia, who I picked off a park bench 10 years ago, the world calls her handicapped because on her right hand she's got a thumb and four little fingers. Her hand never developed. And she was brutalized all through her days in the orphanage for being a freak. And when we signed the contracts for Vatka, Nadia went and bought a village. I don't know if you understand that. <laughs> Nadia bought the village for us. So we um, are in a race to, with 20 months to pay this. And uh, let me, tell you, let me give, give you an idea as to the favor of God. Uh, I got a text call from Mark Islam. How many of us day star television? Well, Mark has called me. He's been a friend of mine for many years. And I, I, hey, what's happening? I, I've been doing good with you all checking up with me. And I said, well, you don't believe what God's done. So I told him. And I said, there's six houses and it's $600,000. Uh, he, he, he says, well, how much? I said, I said 100000 for one house. And he texts me back and he says, day star will buy the first house. So the first house is bought. How are we going to do this? The offering you receive, we give today, whatever you can give, whatever it is, is going to help tomorrow start working on the building. Now, I know some of you guys, are, there are builders in here. If you're looking for sheetrock guys, desperate, you're looking for plumbers, you're looking for tile guys, for finishers that can do um, baseboard and, and trim out doors and stuff. And uh, I'd love to see a team come from this church. I, I want to see a team come from the, all the folks as a visit and a ministry team. So we're looking for workers to come over and start working in this housing because time is running against us. There are young folk needing a place to camp. So the offering in general will go towards that today. But the Lord has challenged me to believe God for 300 people, a Gideon's army of 300 people that will give $2,000. Now you can give it all today. I dance and shout and hoot and holler and send the money to Moldova. Most folk don't have that kind of cash available. But could you believe God with me for $100 a month for 20 months? That's the same as this. You understand what I'm saying? Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Everyone being a part of this thing will make it a, an easy job. It, 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 won't, it, it won't be a hard thing. But if, if I'm going to carry this load of myself, going to get pretty heavy pretty quick. But I believe that God is going to speak to folk today to give this and make this miracle happen. We have a card. I'm, I'm, I've always, this is how I keep myself in place. We're not going to give these out today, but I want to remind you of it. It just says the miracle of Vatra Village. If you can give $2,000 either today or over the next 20 months at $100 a month, you can be one of 300 people that make this possible. Now you say, well, Philip, what else? That's more money than you need. No, it is not. If you saw the video, the buildings are not finished. You, you notice that. They, they are at a state about 80%, 85% that we need to start working on them right now. So the cash, the money in the offering we give is going to go towards starting to fix the buildings up. The 300 people are going to make the miracle happen of actually buying the buildings. How many understand that? Is that clear? 
So if you could give that today, it would be a huge blessing. I'm not going to pass these cards out, but if you feel to do that, go and talk to Andrew. Stand up, Andrew. That's my son back there. And uh, he, if you talk to him afterwards and say to him, I, I want to be, be one of the 300. If, if, we can keep, if we can keep up this money, what, what we're doing just now, how it's worked out, the deal I made was that I'm paying $10,000 a month every month. Okay, and then at the end of the 20 months, I'm going to make a balloon payment. Are you with me? So what I'm trying to do is if I can get enough folks every week to create a month's support, then I'm going to start gaining on the, on the balloon at the end. How many, are you with me? I, I hope it's not too complicated for you. But if you, if you could give, if I were to take you, listen to me, if I were to take you to Vaca, now listen to this. If I were to stand you in Vaca, six houses, 90 kids sold, lives, lives saved. If I were to say to you, I can buy the, all of these houses, all of them, for $2,000. All six houses, mine today, for $2,000. There isn't one of you that wouldn't say, let me go and try and find $2,000. This is too good a deal to miss. My God, this is amazing. Wouldn't you? I can make someone think that 300 times, this becomes a reality. Some of you got a car you don't need. Some of you got stuff you can sell. A lady brought last week and she said, I've got a car. It's only worth, worth $1,000, but I'm going to sell it. But I'm going to believe God for the second thousand we sell it. You can, you can find this if your heart is fully open. So let, let the Lord talk to your heart. And... Uh, after church, we've got t-shirts. There's a brand new one called Together to Get Her. You get it? Together. How do we get her? How do we save Sylvia? Together. And there's a new one, a red one. Do we, anyone need that? Stand up, Belina, back there. It just says, my friends are being trafficked. It's a very powerful witnessing tool. Get that afterwards. The girls do paintings. You, I know you guys like these paintings because you bought a ton of them already. We've got some new ones with us some jewelry that Galena make, get them afterwards. And how many will promise? Listen, guys, I need your money. I need your money. I need your money. But I need your prayers a whole lot more. How many will promise to pray with me over the next 20 months that God speaks to 300 people to give $2,000? And in the offerings that we'll receive, people will like, I can give $100 this while, or five, whatever it is. That money will be used this week to start buying the supplies, to start fixing these houses up, and um, in the future, we're going to be taking furniture from America. It's cheaper to buy furniture here and ship it there than it is to buy it there because the quality is so bad over there, it falls apart. So if anyone knows someone that works in the furniture business, I'm interested. If you'd like to help us this coming Christmas, then we have a Christmas gift tent that goes to Moldova every Christmas. We would love you to be a part of that. Christmas gifts and boxes for orphans is one of the things that our kids do. Most kids, most ministries... Just throw the, 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 the box and leave. Our kids go, know the orphan, know the, know the workers in the orphanage, and make sure that the kids get the gift, because most gifts don't end up in the hands of the kids. They end up in the hands of the workers at home and their kids. So if you want to help us any of these ways, you are part of our family, you are part of our team, and I can't tell you how much I love you, even though your pastor is an Irishman. Jesus, my God. I have... And I'm half one. That's even, it's almost more painful. Thank you so much. We love you. God bless you. Remember, if you want to be part of the, the, the Gideon's army, go back and talk to Andrew. If you fill the card, or give that to Andrew as well. Thank you so much. Love you, brother. So glad to have you today in the team. God bless you, brother. All right, folks. So here's what we're going to do this morning as we get ready to, to go. How many of you were blessed this morning? How many of you were challenged this morning? Our prayer is that your eyes are open. We, we don't want you just looking at what God is doing here in Severn or Glen Burnie, Maryland, but we recognize that God is moving all over this world. We want to join hands, and we say this to you all the time when we bring folks in. There's a lot of people that want to come and preach in this pulpit. We only join together with people who are changing this world for Jesus Christ. Philip and his crew are doing exactly that, touching the lives of these young people. I'm believing from this church that we're going to be able to do that just when Philip asks, we're going to be able to take one of those months um, that they're building or, or buying this city. Uh, it's $10,000 for that. So I would love 
at the end of the day to be able to present him a, a check for that and for, the, for Calvary Chapel to be able to cover one of those months. So uh, if God places that on your heart, the Holy Spirit puts an amount towards that, please make sure. I'm going to ask you right now, fill out your checks. You'll fill them out to Calvary Chapel, what you're about to, uh, to give. So the check will go to Calvary Chapel, but then in your memo, just put Orphan's Hands. If you've already put something else, if you've put Cameron's, if you've already filled out your check to the orphan's hands, um, that's fine. Um, trust me, um, whatever you give, Philip will take it in any way. We'll, we'll make sure that, uh, and in case you're new with us, when we receive offerings like this, we want you to know that when we take it up for a ministry, 100% of what is given goes to that ministry. So we don't take a, um, a cut from the church or, or take things out. That'll go directly to him. So we're believing, we're, we're so glad for the lives of the girls. Wasn't it beautiful today to see all the girls and testifying and singing? We, we're so glad. Ladies, we're so glad that you were, uh, you're here with us today. It was an honor and a privilege for us. But we're believing for many more. Um, brother, you said those homes hold 90 girls? 90 girls. So we're believing in the years to come. Philip has been with us for 20 years uh, here at Calvary, plus over 20 years. So we're believing. Can you imagine the number of lives that would be changed if you're talking about 90 girls every year for the next 20 years? You're talking about literally changing villages and cities for the kingdom of God. And then they raise up, and they're going to be doing Bible colleges and, and spreading the, the word of God. So it's an honor and a privilege to give. Here's what we're going to do this morning. In just a moment, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward, and then we're going to be right here at the front. We're going to pray for this ministry, pray for Philip and the girls, and then we'll also pray a prayer of dismissal. We'll invite you to come forward. They'll stick a, a video on in, in the back, and then uh, we'll invite you to come forward to give into this ministry. And then, as Philip said, he and the girls will be in the back. Uh, go and see them. Purchase, look at the t-shirts, the paintings, uh, get involved, allow your lives to, to get joined with a, a ministry that's changing the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Well, let's do this. Ushers, can I invite you forward this morning? And we're going to get ready to join together as we, uh, as we go forth into this world. We are commissioned as ministers of the gospel, amen? Amen. Every single one of us is called as a minister. Would you join me today? Would you stand to your feet all over the sanctuary? I'm going to come down, and we're just grateful for our, our brother, half Irish as he is. Let's pray. The other half needs a lot of prayer. <laughs> Father, we're humbled and we're honored to be used in your kingdom. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done, Lord, for the lives through these 20 years, young people that have been changed, young people that had no hope, much less any faith, never knew what a, a family was, never knew, as we sang that song, a good, good father, they never knew the concept of having a good father. Lord, I thank you that there is a ministry of love, a ministry of restoration, reconciliation, The girls that were the, what the devil thought were meant for the streets were meant for sex trafficking, are now being used as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where they now share your love. They now preach in the streets that they were going to be sold on. Now they're used to rescue others and bring them into the kingdom of God. God, we thank you for this ministry. Lord, we thank you for the hundreds and even thousands of lives that have been touched. And God, we thank you for the thousands that will be touched. Lord, we thank you for giving us the opportunity, Lord, to be in a, a part of this ministry, to stand in faith, to stand in prayer, to stand and give with our finances. Lord, we pray for the Cameron family. Lord, we pray for Reverend Philip, Lord, for his wife, Chrissy. Lord, for, for Andrew and for Natalie and for all those that, that you've called alongside. Lord, we pray their hands would be strengthened today, O oh God. Lord, that you'd strengthen them, Lord, according to the power of your might. God, I thank you for a fresh anointing and fresh word that you place in them. Lord, we pray for continued protection over their lives, even as they travel to the nations, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing in this ministry, and we bless them today giving you glory, honor, and praise. And Lord, as we leave from this place today, I thank you for a blessing over your people, oh God. Lord, as they go, Lord, I thank you for the word that you place in our mouths. That Lord, the goodness of our God, the love of Jesus would flow in us 
and flow through us. As we go from this place, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, we love you with the love of the Lord. Come and give today and then share that love with one another as you